Today, we're very fortunate to have Kai Stern from Stephen Winter Associates moderate this program. So Kai, please take it away. Great, thanks Vera. Morning, every, or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kai Starn, a senior sustainability consultant at Stephen Winter Associates and chair of the Connecticut Green Building Council. Urban Green's values are excellence, inclusion, collaboration, and engagement. And we invite you to be mindful of these during the program when you're viewing the presentation and asking questions. Um, so with that, I'm excited to introduce the speakers. Uh, today, we'll hear from Bruce Redmond Becker, of, president of Becker & Becker. Ian Donahue, Project Manager at LN Consulting, John Askew, Principal at LN Consulting, Kate Doherty, Building Systems Analyst at Stephen Winter Associates, and Aaron Kruger, Project Manager at Consigli Construction. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with such a fantastic panel and our audience. Um, as the sustainability consultant doing the LEED certification, I had the privilege of, of working with the panelists on this remarkable project. Um, so there's no single definition or formula for a sustainable building, um, but things we typically see in a healthy, but there are things that we typically see in a healthy low carbon building. So the attributes found in Hotel Marcel you'll learn about today um, really demonstrate the highest levels of sustainability and resilience uh, from the building reuse to low impact building materials, uh, zero operational energy and superior indoor air quality and comfort. And we use the LEED and Passive House certification standards to help measure and verify many of those innovations. So for instance, combining the, the careful selection of lower impact healthy materials from LEED with highly efficient energy ventilation and thermal comfort criteria um, really ensures the superior indoor air quality and overall lower whole building impacts on people and their environment. So through this, we the synergy created between Passive House, LEED, the skilled construction and design team um, comes together as a real powerful combination to address the critical climate issues that impact everyone. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to the first speaker. Over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Kai. Um, let me just advance the slide here. If I can get control of the slides, here we go. <clears throat> uh, so my name is Bruce Becker. I'm the president of Becker and Becker Associates. Uh, we're based in Westport, Connecticut, and are um, somewhat unique uh, in that we're both architect and developer and sometimes owner of many projects. Although uh, that's new, not true for every project, but um, the ones that have allowed us to go a little deeper in terms of sustainability are ones where we actually are, are in a position to uh, to make the larger decisions about site selection and um, sustainability objectives. <clears throat> and we have a great team, uh, uh, probably the biggest contributors of, uh, to, to which are already on the uh, uh, you know on this panel uh, with Consigli Construction. Uh, uh, Aaron Kruger is on as a panelist and uh, Swaz has been a major contributor in terms of guiding us through the passive house uh, and uh, lead process and also the um, uh, envelope consulting. And then uh, our go-to uh, uh, mechanical electrical engineers, uh, LN uh, Consulting out of uh, uh, Burlington, Vermont have helped us along the way. But I want to give an overview here of uh, the project and its history in, uh, in about six minutes. And then we'll let the experts dive in and explain each of their respective disciplines and the challenges. And then we'll have a chance to answer questions afterwards. Uh, but the Armstrong Rubber Company building, um, which you see in the photograph here, was uh, built uh, in the late 60s. Um, and the original architect was Marcel Breuer legendary Bauhaus um, trained architect who also uh, 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 taught a whole generation of leading mid-century modern architects at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. His students were a who's who of uh, modern architecture, Philip Johnson, uh, John Johansson, uh, Edward Larrabee Barnes, um, uh, uh, Elliot Noyes, I mean, it was very cool. You know, a whole generation of leading mid-century modern architects, many of whom came to New Canaan and settled with the as the Harvard Five, but then their practices 
were international. And um, but we this building was occupied until the late '90s um, by Armstrong Rubber Company and then by the Prelly Tire Company, and then it was um, it was sort of left vacant for 20 years, where we had an opportunity to come up with a new plan for it. Um, and our recent work has been focused on trying to address the climate crisis uh, while repurposing buildings. And uh, a principle has been to just not have any fossil fuels involved. It's, it's, uh, it's now widely known that um, if we have a, make a building that uses fossil fuels, we're, we're contributing to the climate crisis. And um, so it's really a mandate for everything we're involved in um, to, to not use fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> that was a guiding principle, but also beyond that, um, if we can reuse an existing building, um, and this was really a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to work with a, a piece of first-class architecture, um, uh, then you can avoid the carbon impact of the whole process of building a new structure and foundations. And you know, we were able to recycle about 90% of the mass of the building uh, by uh, we had to remove uh, most of the interiors because of asbestos contamination, but um, worked um, with the National Park Service and the State Historic Preservation Office to preserve um, you know, a few remaining spaces, such as the top floor executive offices and uh, the entry lobby elements. But then we had a free hand to reprogram the building as a hotel. <clears throat> See how do we advance here? So here's the um, the program for uh, reinvention of the building. Uh, while it historically was an office building, um, it actually I think is even better suited as a hotel. So uh, we created 165 hotel rooms, including 7,000 square feet of meeting space. Uh, we listed it on the National Register. It had been listed on the State Register of Historic Places. That was an important part of our funding to utilize historic tax credits. And then in order to make the project financeable and marketable, we also affiliated with Hilton. We're now part of the boutique uh, tapestry collection. And um, those were um, extensive, uh, there were extensive a number of program requirements to achieve that affiliation. Uh, but on top of those requirements, we sort of set our own goals for sustainability you know, the last two projects we did were lead platinum. So that's sort of a natural for us, although we were surprised that there are fewer than a dozen hotels in the United States that have that certification. Uh, I'd become increasingly enamored with the passive house standard, um, but this is the first passive house project we've undertaken. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot. In fact, of all the things we did, probably the passive house was the simplest and least expensive to achieve uh, just by focusing on the integrity of the building envelope, air sealing and insula insulation. And of course, SWA made that easy for us to navigate. Um, uh, again, we, we set a rule that we wouldn't use fossil fuels. Initially, we weren't sure we could achieve that uh, with domestic hot water, uh, but uh, as we were in design development uh, and actually starting construction, uh, we were lucky that Mitsubishi was starting to distribute their commercial scale uh, uh, heat pump domestic hot water units. So we have incorporated that and all the, the kitchen is all electric as well as is the laundry. So the building doesn't even have a fossil fuel connection. We use a battery system for emergency power. Uh, we, um, we also had uh, a large roof area, flat roof area and we had parking areas as well. And so we deployed canopies to allow us to generate as much energy as we believe we'll need. We did an energy model that um, uh, we are following to, uh, to balance our electric use with electric production uh, so that we could be net zero. Um, that apparently is a first, although uh, we're not aware of any other hotel that has achieved that in the United States. Other things that we did to reduce our, our energy budget is that we integrated power over ethernet for lighting and shade control by having the uh, lighting and shade control um, uh, and power in that one system that also reduced our energy use for, for um, that. So 
but quickly, here's what the shell of the building looked like when we started. Um, you know, the lower two floors had already been abated. Uh, this is a quick view of our plan where we have uh, the perimeter uh, all on all four sides was used for guest rooms. The core of the building has battery rooms, has, um, we actually have two light wells. So we do have a 14 rooms that are on the interior with natural light. <clears throat> and then we also have uh, uh, taken the top level, which was windowless previously and made that meeting areas you can see in the section. Um, and then the first floor, is, uh, you know, we have 185 foot clear space for a restaurant and lounge, and we have meeting rooms on the first floor as well. <clears throat> uh, we spent a lot of time with the building system. It uses the Mosai um, uh, precast system and worked with SWA to come up with a program for insulating that to um, surpass the, the what, you know, the, the code requirements, but also the passive house standards. We created this energy model uh, that was an iterative one to help us plan for the energy use and production. Uh, and here you see uh, the uh, combination of closed cell and open cell uh, and aerogel blanket materials that allowed us to super insulate the exterior of the building we have the first triple glazed windows approved by the National Park Service uh, that, um, that um, uh, also have the benefit of making the rooms very quiet. Here's some uh, pictures of our model rooms with original artwork and shades. This is the one of the corner kings um, and the corridors and the classic Marcel Breuer stairs, which has some of the same elements as the original Whitney Museum. Um, and here's a uh, view of the roof with the solar arrays and the solar canopies here. Uh, the, we have a bolt server for providing DC power to all of our lighting and shades. We actually recycled cycled the light fixtures themselves, uh, retrofitted them with LED uh, POE lighting. And here you see the, uh, the heat pump domestic hot water units, the batteries, the uh, EPC inverters and, and the Ojito microgrid controller, which controls our one megawatt hour battery system. Uh, so just in summary, we have sort of three, three recommendations to deal with any building for the climate crisis, uh, make the building as efficient as possible, uh, super insulate, seal the building envelope, uh, use high efficiency equipment, POE lighting, and then um, finally, uh, uh, you know, electrify everything. So that's the introduction. But I'm going to let the experts take over the uh, their and talk to their specific disciplines because we really had some great experts involved. I guess John and Ian, you're going to take the helm and talk about the engineering aspects. Yeah, John, do you want to start? Yeah, I'm trying to say, um, I just wanted to introduce ourselves, maybe go to the next screen, but uh, we're with LN Consulting. We're an MEP firm uh, based in Burlington, Vermont. I won't go into everything that we do, so we um, don't take up any time, but I just want to let you know we do a number of uh, things involving uh, involving uh, uh, sustainable energy and net zero systems. I'm gonna let Ian take it from here and talk about the mechanical systems. Hi, yes, uh, so the Hotel Marcel is uh, conditioned throughout by Mitsubishi uh, VRF units. They are the latest generation, high efficiency simultaneous heating and cooling units. Uh, we have uh, equipment located both on the ground floor in a courtyard space, which you can see on the two right photos. And then there's also units located on the ninth floor in an exposed mezzanine space just below the roof, which are in the upper two photos here, the two left photos. I guess, uh, next slide. Uh, so space conditioning throughout the facility, again, by the VRF units, it's a combination of ductless and ducted uh, fan coils. Uh, all of the spaces, uh, the heating and cooling loads reside 
from an energy model that was run. Uh, so all the peak heating and cooling loads were, were specifically sized uh, based on that. So guest rooms have ductless uh, recessed one-way blow cassette units, as you can see in the upper left photo. Uh, generally, the common area spaces have ducted fan coil units uh, in the right photo. If you go, uh, go back one photo, I guess. Uh, so the right two photos have the, uh, the ducted fan coils, and then the lower left photo is the branch selector boxes, which are located on each system to enable the simultaneous heating and cooling. And uh, isolation valves, kind of tough to see, but isolation valves are on each individual branch for servicing. So uh, <clears throat> in the IT room and battery rooms, there's cooling required throughout the year. Uh, these are cooled in a couple different ways. We have exhaust going back to the energy recovery units uh, to provide some additional uh, energy recovery for the incoming outdoor air. And these are also connected to the multi-zone uh, Mitsubishi units to provide the energy sharing and the simultaneous heating and cooling operation. Dedicated one-to-one -one split units are also located in each space to provide dedicated cooling during emergency conditions and conditions when the Mitsubishi systems uh, cannot provide the simultaneous cooling such as below zero temperatures. Uh, ventilation for the facility is ducted throughout. Uh, so it's a fully ducted system. There are two Swagon uh, energy recovery units located on the ninth floor with uh, EC fan motors, variable speed, high efficiency energy recovery wheels, uh, and DX post conditioning coils connected to dedicated BRF units um, to provide heating, cooling, and dehumidification capabilities of the, uh, of the ventilation air. The VAV boxes, uh, there's VAV boxes located throughout the system to actually control the flow to each individual zone. Um, we are ducting the ventilation air directly to the returns of the ducted heat pumps and into the knockouts of the ductless heat pumps. Uh, it's kind of tough to see, but that middle photo is one of the ductless uh, guest room heat pumps and the, the knockout you can see just barely in that photo. Uh, but we are also controlling based on CO2 and occupied unoccupied sequences. The, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the kitchens have all electric cooling cap uh, heating capabilities with, the, um, with all equipment. This enables us to use recirculating type one exhaust systems uh, to enable us not to install a makeup air or uh, grease exhaust uh, system for this, this the kitchen, um, further reducing energy savings. The ventilation for the kitchen provided by the energy recovery units for odor control and cooling is connected to the the multi-zone Mitsubishi units to, again, provide further energy sharing. Um, as Bruce mentioned, uh, domestic hot water is produced by both a Mitsubishi air-to-water VRF system, which utilizes the CO2 refrigerant, and uh, electric resistance domestic hot water heaters. There are two different domestic hot water plants for the facility. One serves the lower levels and one serves the upper levels. Uh, all of the CO2 heat pumps uh, or Mitsubishi heat pumps are located on the ground level. And there are brace plate heat exchangers, uh, which you can just make out in the upper left photo, which uh, is where the domestic hot water is piped to. Um, so these circulate through the brace plate heat exchangers and then domestic hot water is circulated through those brace, brace plate heat exchangers. The domestic hot water plants are located on the second and eighth floor. Uh, the second, both of them are, are essentially the same. There's two thermal storage tanks, which you can just make out in the upper left photo, and a electric resistance domestic hot water heater. Uh, there, the heat2O controller on the lower right controls the Mitsubishi system, which heats the two thermal storage tanks. And the circulator pumps circulate the domestic hot water back down to the first floor through the brace bay heat exchangers. In the middle photo, you can see that there's a powers and tele station electronic mixing valve, which controls the domestic hot water that's supplied to the rest of the facility. And this is a couple quick diagrams of the domestic hot water system. The upper left diagram is a sample uh, schematic that shows sensors and pumps uh, for the Mitsubishi system. Um, and the right two photo uh, diagrams are of the actual domestic hot water system. So the upper right photo shows the uh, heat, air to water heat pump uh, located on the ground level, which is piped to the heat exchanger. 
and the lower right photo shows the thermal storage tanks and the electric resistance water heaters. The through the DDC system and uh, tough to make out, but uh, research or pump number four just above the water heater, we have the ability to backfeed the two thermal storage tanks uh, with control valves to heat each individual tank as necessary from the electric resistance water heater to provide uh, additional redundancy for the system. And I'll turn it over to John to continue with the electric side. All righty, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the electrical. This is uh, several photos of the main electric service. When we first started this project, it was a 1200 amp 208 volt system. Um, located indoors with our main surface equipment. By the time we were done with all the electrification, we basically went up to 2000 amps at 480, essentially tripling the size of the service, requiring us to locate it outdoors. So we made our little switch yard there. You can see it uh, off the upper right. We also show some equipment to the left where we had CT cabinets for the PV and the battery system and their disconnects. And then in the bottom uh, left corner, we, you, the right corner, you can sort of see what it looks like when it's all done hidden behind a fence. Um, next, uh, this is just a, several photos of the uh, PV system. Uh, Bruce has sort of alluded to this already. Um, the left is the canopy, the right is the uh, rooftop, and then in the bottom left corner, you can see one of the inverters. There's about six of these throughout, um, providing conversion from the DC off to AC and then tying to the building's electrical system. This is the uh, battery energy storage system. Once again, Bruce talked a little bit about this. The EPC power to the left is a 250 kW inverter. And each inverter, there's two of them, have a 165 kW, 506 kWh of uh, power and energy. Uh, we have them on two different floors. Um, they put in two racks. Um, we're using this for emergency power as well. So. Uh, there are some spots where we're running cable that were not sprinklered. We were required then to provide fire rated cable. And you can see in the right photo that copper colored cable, uh, much more expensive, but uh, something we had to do to, uh, to accommodate the, uh, the fact that we're using this battery system for uh, life safety as well as uh, alternative power. This is the balance of the system. Basically, this is just the tie between the batteries, the inverters and the microgrid system uh, to allow them to communicate, monitor each other. Um, if there's any power, any uh, you know power problems or uh, equipment failures, it will send a signal off and let us know what's going on. But it allows all the systems to tie together. This is uh, several pictures of the microgrid control system itself. Uh, the controller is on the upper left. So everything comes back to this. Uh, it basically controls the battery, the PV. Uh, the uh, utility load shedding, peak shaving, the ability to go off grid if we had to or wanted to, and then synchronization to tie back into the utility. We're still working on getting that approved, but when we're all done, we'll be able to basically go off grid, come back on grid, be able to produce power, send it to the grid when we have excess. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, it's all optimized to make sure that it's done at the correct time, so nighttime, daytime, et cetera. The right photos are just a couple of photos of the relay that allows us to tie into the utility. This is a screen showing basically what's happening. Uh, on the left, you can see a little plug there. That's the load of the building, 158 kW at the time. On the right is the solar producing 233, the two batteries systems producing 154, 153 each. And then you can see going off to the transmission system, uh, we're actually sending out 396 kW of uh, power into the grid at this time. This is a screenshot of uh, basically they have real-time parameters that you can monitor things. Uh, you'll notice during the day, the green line is the solar. It goes up in a little bell curve. When that goes up, the sort of bluish purple goes down. That's the utility power coming in. So you can see we're actually, um, sending power back into the grid, you know, negative 250 or so. Uh, the load is the orange line, so that sort of stays more or less constant, except for some peak periods. 
Um, and then the, the yellow is the battery. So you can see at nighttime when the PV isn't operating, there's a couple of times when the battery operates. And as soon as that PV comes on, we use it to charge those batteries. So, so you'll see the yellow actually dip down below zero as it's charging, and then eventually it gets back up to close to 85%, which is that purple line along the top. The volt server system, this is a method of basically sending power, I wanna say digitally, from one end to another. So on the left, you'll see these transmitters, the left photo, they get 277 volts from a panel board. They take that and through those white wires, they basically send digital energy. In fact, this is so new that the NE National Electric Code 2023 is gonna produce a whole new section just for this type of system. So those white wires go off to some remote location and then that remote location, they come back in those white wires back to a terminal strip like you see in that center photo and go to these receivers, the RXACs that will convert it back into uh, usable power. In this case, we're converting it to 24 volt DC to use for our POE system, uh, power over ethernet for lighting, controls, things of that nature. Taking this one step further, so you can see those blue, uh, from those receivers, you go to these uh, basically patch panels, just like an IT room. These blue cables go off to basically these, uh, these controllers that provide power and control to the light fixture. In this project, we're using their Igor control relays. Like there's three photos to the right there showing different ways of installing. The left photo is just on a wall where we don't care about aesthetics. You'll see that white wire leaving that, that's going off to the light fixture. The middle one is basically a closet full of these Igor relays that are used to power up a number of smaller fixtures. You can't house one of these because they're too small. And then the upper right corner, you'll see a larger fixture, mostly the ceiling fixtures, that basically we locate these inside the fixture. We basically take the LED driver out, put these in and they do the same thing. You can see this POE system also is being used to control the lighting because those uh, CAT6 cables, those blue cables we saw are used for power as well as control. Um, so they're used throughout. It's kind of like kill two birds with one stone with a cable. And then on the right, you'll just see that white wire I was talking about earlier running off to a light fixture. And that white wire is basically providing 24 volt power and control to that light fixture. And to accommodate the fact that the battery system is being used for emergency power as well, we need to be able to shed normal power if we ever come under a condition where the battery does not have enough capacity to uh, provide uh, power for both the emergency and normal power. So what we'll end up doing is we'll end up shedding the normal power and then the emergency side can just tie into that, uh, or the battery can just tie into the emergency only. Um, we also provide some relaying for lead certification. They're in those boxes. Um, it's used for that and for load monitoring. And this is just showing some of the loads we're using. Uh, Ian already talked about the uh, heat pump water system. The uh, middle photo there is a couple of 190 kW dryers. Just to put it in perspective, um, a regular dryer in your house is 5 kW. So it's pretty big. The right just showing a screen, showing the fire pump running on emergency power. And then the bottom left corner is uh, just the electric kitchen that was already talked about. Uh, and that's pretty much it for the electrical system. And uh, we talked to the talk about the, uh, the next. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Darty. I am here with Stephen Winter Associates. I was on the Passive House team, the Passive House consultant on the project. Um, I'm not sure I can, you can control, let's take control here. All right, so this is just our, a little bit about our company. Um, I wanna leave time for questions at the end. So I'll, I'll breeze through some of the Passive House information and kind of how this all ties together into the certification programs. Uh, next slide, please. So these are a few of the, the roles that SWA had on this project. We were the, the passive house consultant. Uh, we worked on the lead certification for the building. We had some enclosures consulting done on the project to make sure that moisture and 
the historic facade wouldn't become a problem for future resilience of the building. And we had accessibility consulting on the project as well. So a few of the certifications and the goals that this project was pursuing. From the very start, Becker and Becker knew that they wanted this building to be next level. They wanted to achieve these goals. Uh, so I wanna emphasize here the integrated design concept. Get everyone involved in your project early, as early as you can. It helps with streamlining the design. It helps with flushing out any design issues or any concerns early on in the project. And it just allows projects to reach these exciting goals like net zero, passive house, lead, et cetera. <clears throat> so everyone before me spoke to the passive house um, or to the photovoltaics a little bit, um, but I'll mention that the PV is covering 100% of the building's energy. Um, it's in two phases. So I have those two numbers there for the two phases of built PV. And ultimately the PV will help this building reach net zero. Next slide, please. So question for the audience, you know, what is even better than having to use PV? And we'll go to the next slide. Not needing as much PV to offset your building. So with this project, we're emphasizing the lower loads, driving those loads for the overall building's use down first to have less that you need to offset. And this is an important concept, especially for our buildings that we see in New York City or in higher density areas where you might not have the roof area or you might not have the carport canopy benefit that this project was able to take um, use of. But if we drive those loads down, um, and John mentioned, you know, the loads were pretty consistent throughout the day, whereas in less efficient buildings, you might see a higher load in the building at the middle of the day when the sun is shining and the air conditioning is, is really ramping up. So keeping those loads consistent and ultimately driving them down, um, you need less PV to reach that goal of net zero. So move forward. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about net zero and passive house at the hotel. So passive house for anyone who doesn't know is a performance-based standard. Uh, there's a new construction as well as an inner fit pathway for that program. Uh, this project as a historic retrofit building is following that, that inner fit pathway. Um, and these were some of the key considerations that we had to take into consideration for our model in order to make sure that they were passing their air tightness uh, their demand levels and the, uh, the site energy requirement for passive house. Um, and then there were a few R value component um, thresholds as well that needed to be met for this pathway. So the goal was to be net zero to cover the whole building's energy. So we'll move to the next slide. So these three that I've highlighted here are gonna be the ones that we've touched on throughout the presentation. The other presenters have talked about these as well. And we'll move on to the next. Um, so with the kitchen, it was important for us to model the internal heat gains. Um, we're able to take credit for some of those in achieving the passive house standard. And we have to account for the electrical usage as well. So we worked with the kitchen designer and the uh, consultant that did the energy model uh, to get those numbers into our model as accurately as possible. Uh, and we discussed the possibility of those all electric appliances early on in the project as well. Can we move forward, please. So this is just a brief example um, of an equipment schedule, what it looks like when we receive it. So we went through the specs for all of the equipment to see if we could match the energy use that the energy consultant was getting. And we came in pretty similarly. So ultimately we were able to get that in our model. Um, and there were some discussions about the menu as well. If you keep in mind, um, an electric kitchen is a healthy kitchen for both the staff and for the people. So less energy meals are things like fresh vegetables and healthier foods. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, less fried food, not that there's any limitations with the menu, they were able to include all sorts of uh, staples that you would see in a regular kitchen with this all electric kitchen. We'll move forward, please. Um, so I won't dwell too much on this because we went over it already. I will plug our podcast. Uh, we did an episode with Chris Galarza for the, the Buildings and Beyond podcast for SWA. So if you want a little bit more information about what it means to switch to an all electric kitchen, please feel free to access that where you access podcasts. Um, and then again, electrification of DHW, we just wanna emphasize efficient circulation 
of the pipe layout and then lowering those loads. So the low flow fixtures, things like that, um, that can kind of play into lead a little bit as well. Those bring the loads down and you know more efficiencies, less heat loss and less energy needed to heat up that water for the hotel. Move forward. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the historic challenges. Um, Bruce alluded to the, the insulation strategy. Our, our consultant, the enclosures consultant, did some moisture mitigation modeling to make sure that the interior closed cell spray foam and fireproofing method would not incur any moisture concerns. Um, and then also we had some window limitations in order to match the existing windows and what they looked like. We had only a few products, but we were able to find a low profile um, triple pane window that would satisfy those requirements as well. Um, and then the next one or two slides is just some examples. Um, this was a shading analysis that we had done to take into account the shading on the facade. Um, Marcel, Marcel Breuer was ahead of his time with the, this design. You can see there, this is the middle of June in the middle of the day and look at how shaded that window is just by the design of the building with that, that concrete facade kind of shading. So that prevents overheating um, and played into the, the energy model for us as well. And then this is just one last um, model for, I had done this model to make sure that the enclosures with the existing metal slab condition um, and how the fireproofing insulation would tie into that air barrier would make sure you could see the consistency of the red line shows that no heat is leaving the building uh, and no cold from outside is getting in. So we have a nice tight insulated air proofed building. Um, and then, I have these in at the end if we need to reference them, but um, ultimately I will hand it over to our um, moderator. Thank you. Great, <clears throat> thanks Kate, thanks everyone. Uh, I'd like to invite all the panelists to start their video. And please welcome Aaron Kruger with Consigli Construction uh, who will join us for the Q&A portion. Uh, Good afternoon. Just, thanks. Aaron, do you want to give just a, a quick intro for yourself? Yeah, quick intro. Aaron Krieger, project manager, been working with Bruce for a couple of years now. Um, Consigli Construction has, has uh, handled a, a good portion. Um, we've shared responsibility with Bruce on, on some of the trades, um, but just, you know, proud to be part of the project. Thanks for joining us. So we're just opening up the panel to discussions uh, for about 15 minutes or so. Um, so please do submit your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to them. Let's see here. Uh, in the meantime, um, question for Bruce, uh, what planning suggestions would you give to, to other developers who are looking at doing uh, adaptive reuse? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I would actually consider the adaptive reuse um, before considering new construction. I mean, if you have the, uh, um, if you're an owner looking to create a facility of any kind, um, you know, your, your, the carbon impact of adaptive reuse is going to be lower than, than new construction, maybe save for a timber structure. And, uh, but obviously not every building, uh, is as well suited for, uh, net zero or passive house as, as we are, we were very lucky as Kate mentioned with the, the facade design of Marcel Breuer, it, it, uh, its orientation and it's um, the deep set windows uh, were a real plus. Uh, you know, I think the, from a planning perspective, uh, you know, we always advocate an iterative approach and um, you, know, you know, sometimes that particularly, um, try to do the iterations before you start construction, but as Aaron can attest, we didn't stop because of, you know, when we found out about some new systems like the domestic hot water heat pump system, you know, we pivoted. You know, I think if we were able to um, spend a little more time in pre-construction to, uh, to, you know, to finish those iterations, it would have been a, a, a little simpler for, um, for Consigli, but, you know, we didn't want to lose the opportunity to make the building as efficient as possible and to achieve our, our, sustainability goals. Um, sometimes 
you know, the products aren't available and uh, you have to shift. So I guess in general, people, you know, have a great team that can take an integrated approach. Um, realize that you have to test different directions. Not all of them work. Get an energy model early on and, and cycle it through to, to test different scenarios. Um, but I think if you, um, if you're willing to go through those iterations and when you make a design decision, make sure it's informed by, you know, all the perspectives, you know, represented by the panel, then I think you, you'll have a successful outcome. Great. Thanks, Bruce. All right. Just waiting to see, get some uh, questions through the chat. Um, let's see here. Um, Kate, were there any envelope uh, challenges uh, to improving the envelope in the enclosure that you wanted to highlight? Sure. Yeah. Like I mentioned, our main concern was the moisture mitigation. We wanted to make sure that that would not be an issue. Um, with this project, the facade was historic, so we were not able to do any sort of insulating to the exterior. That might be a strategy that you would use in another retrofit project. Um, so with that being said, you know, we did the closed cell low VOC spray foam on the interior. Um, so interior only insulation, which sometimes draws that question of moisture issues, but you know, our modeling, we were able to make sure that that would not be an issue um, and that the system would be able to dry out properly. So those, the historic aspect of the building kind of posed some, not challenges, but you know, differences in the strategy that we, that we went for with that. We were lucky, you know, the, the Mosai, uh, precast panel system, you know, which is like a 6,000 PSI con uh, concrete. It, um, it was, you know, modeled by SWA and it, it, um, you know, it, it, it really actually helped us, uh, uh, with a air sealed, um, envelope and also, uh, um, the sort of moisture infiltration issues that Kate was talking about. So not all buildings, um, would do that, but uh, it's important to sort of evaluate and and take a approach based on existing conditions. Yeah, thanks. Thank you both. Um, for Ian, uh, were you able to rely on heat pump domestic hot water to cater to the peak demand of the hotel? Yeah, so the domestic hot water system sizing was based on a combined approach of both thermal storage and the output of the water heaters themselves. So we sized the system based on the uh, actual, having actual thermal storage and the capacity to, to handle the peak conditions that are expected for the facility. Um, under general circumstances, the heat pump water heater uh, capacity should be picking up the majority of the load uh, with the electric resistance back up to, to supplement as needed during uh, periods of peak demand. Great. And just a follow-up question to the domestic hot water. Um, for the Mitsubishi electric unit, did you consider other brands or, or why did you end up going with Mitsubishi electric product? Uh, yes, another another brand was considered uh, the Link system by Watts. Um, I believe that those were priced out and, and uh, I don't know if they were bid, but they were, they were compared to each other. Um, Watts does have uh, similar equipment um, and, and other, so that was, that was compared, but uh, I believe that these were, um, uh, Based on pricing and, and availability at the time. Correct. Yep, you're correct. Okay. And they were they were the most cost effective option to provide the end result. And I think availability was also an issue for both of them. Um, so we're I, I think now well who knows whether they're both readily available, but um, particularly with the pandemic supply constraints. Uh, um, we only, there were only two possibilities. And I think, uh, yeah, the Mitsubishi system ended up being uh, both available uh, faster and at a lower cost. Yes, it arrived just when we needed it. <laughs> Probably after, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, Consigli was very helpful. Yeah, we learned that you don't always have to follow the normal sequence of construction to end up with a complete building. But we, there are a number of things that um, were done out of sequence, um, but to Consigli's credit, they were flexible and everything uh, came together nicely so that we actually were able to open the hotel before Yale graduation last week, uh, which uh, was never um, a given. Um, so it was quite an achievement by the whole team. 
Great. So we're getting some questions in about incremental costs. Um, first one, um, just upgrading the electrical infrastructure. Um, how, how were you able to justify that cost? Um, were there maybe programs or incentives or, or how did you go about making that decision? You know, the, um, we definitely had some change orders to do that along the way, but also we eliminated having to have a natural gas service entirely. And the, um, you know, we can make electricity on site with solar. We can't make natural gas. So it, it really it did allow us to, uh, you know, with a longer view, uh, you know, have uh, uh, independence from, um, from those costs. Uh, you know, I think the, um, there are some incentives for, you know, we're in the United illuminating territory and they have a energy conscious blueprint program, which uh, incentivizes energy efficiency. Uh, but there are not specific rebates for, you have to make a choice in, in, with the utilities in, in our territory between sort of rebates for specific pieces of equipment and a larger incentive. Uh, our incentive, you know, with um, bonuses for um, uh, for what we think will qualify for, you know, will approach about half a million dollars. So that I think will um, cover the incremental cost for the enlargement of the service. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that insight. Um, other challenges, um, looking sort of at, um, you know, the financing, the zoning, um, mentioned some of the code, the code hasn't caught up to some of these technologies quite yet. Um, you know, how large of an obstacle were those things and, and how did you overcome them? Maybe starting with the, the code question. Yeah, so um, zoning was, um, uh, was a very simple change that uh, was actually done before we acquired the building. Um, the building was in a planned uh, development area that anticipated a change of use for the building. Uh, as far as the building concerned, the building code is concerned, you know, Connecticut has an existing building code that gives more latitude, gave us a little more latitude on things like um, uh, having to sort of have limited modifications to handrails and the stairs uh, and having, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we, the code posed any particular challenges um, uh, in other areas, although uh, we are, you know, the power over ethernet, the battery system, um, you know, they were new to the system, but um, we had a very good code consultant, Phil Sherman, that helped us navigate that um, together with our, our engineers. Um, and if any other team members want to talk about some of, some of the respective challenges for code, I mean, we're, we're um, uh, I would say that the challenges were not so much related to um, code compliance, but for sort of solving all of these criteria simultaneously, the historic preservation requirements for um, having the building qualify for historic tax credits that really defined um, um, programmatic um, and, and finished selections. Um, I think this is the first building that the National Park Service has approved for triple glazed windows, but we're able to, to um, document that there was a precedent in the building and in the broader drawings for an interior uh, storm panel. So um, uh, uh, we were able to maintain the dimension of the original uh, window profile. Um, but then uh, also navigating the, you know, the, the, in a way the passive house, the lead platinum uh, net zero, they all are sort of, um, uh, there aren't really conflicts between those requirements. So um, once we made, made the commitment to have them inform our design decisions, um, you know, that they, um, they really weren't conflicts. I would say um, on some of these things are so new, you know, working with Phil, who's the code expert, there was many instances where we had to basically interpret what we think the code would say if they had something here, and we would actually um, either write a letter to the inspector or we would talk amongst ourselves and basically uh, tell them our interpretation of the code and see whether or not it was what they would interpret from it. So there were a couple instances where um, 
yeah, we weren't quite sure what was going to happen, but for the most part, the inspectors were uh, accommodating, I guess I'd say, and uh, they seemed to be on board with what we were trying to do here. Yeah, I think one thing that came up is we, the power of our Ethernet system, we had visited, you know, with John and um, the LN team, we went to the Sinclair Hotel down in Fort Worth, Texas, because that was the uh, the only other hotel that had used power over Ethernet lighting. And um, uh, there they had all of the, the installation done by basically low voltage installers that weren't necessarily licensed electrical contractors. So we made the decision to embrace the system thinking that it would be a cost savings. I think we found in, in, um, uh, in Connecticut that um, it was a little more restrictive and uh, Sinclair ended up subcontracting to a company that in fact ended up uh, utilizing licensed electrical um, workers for the installation. So I think the, the power of our Ethernet system wasn't necessarily uh, a savings for first cost, but we do think it's gonna achieve savings in terms of energy use down the road. Thank you. Um, some questions are coming in about uh, the level of maintenance, how, how an all electric building may differ from traditional fossil fuel building. Um, and also a companion to that, are there plans to, to track and, and sort of verify performance during operation? Well, sure, certainly there are. I mean, uh, uh, John, I believe showed uh, a graph so we can monitor the uh, microgrid, the energy flow, so we can, we can sort of see in real time our energy use. But you know, when you have fewer systems, um, you know, if you have a diesel generator or gas generator, that needs to be serviced. It might have to run an hour a week just for testing. Um, and the battery system um, really is maintenance free. You have to monitor it and make sure that it's um, it's adjusted properly. But um, I think electric systems generally are easier to maintain um, uh, because you you know you don't have the the gas piping or uh, the combustion that um, adds an additional factor. We actually have less ventilation uh, required when you have um, a recirc hood. Um, we did uh, position our, our dryers in a plenum so that they don't actually require outdoor air, which is an additional savings. Um, but maybe, maybe I'll um, let Ian and John address questions of how the systems might have different maintenance requirements than the typical fossil fuel based systems. Yeah, I mean, I think electrically, I mean, one, you know, um, typically with a diesel generator, you obviously have issues with that. You have transfer switches um, that you have to worry about, you have to make sure the generator starts, make sure it's cold weather rated. Here we have a battery system that's always up and running. If we lose utility power, it's essentially seamless that power is restored to the building as opposed to waiting your 10 seconds or your one minute, depending on what type of system you have going on. And then you're know, transferring back. There's always that blip where things trip out. And this system is almost, it's, it's almost imperceptible. You know, batteries always running. If you lose power, it's as if, I'm gonna say nothing happened, but it's very similar to that. And we, we don't have any gas boilers in the building. I mean, those boilers, they require regular checkups and adjustment and changing up burners every on a certain cycle. Uh, sort of like the difference between uh, owning an electric car and a gas car. I mean, electric cars, you change the washer fluid and maybe change the tires every couple of years, but uh, a regular combustion car, you know, you got to do regular oil changes and change your uh, brake pads and all kinds of stuff. So it, you know, we do think that the an all electric building will be uh, less expensive to maintain. Yeah, And I would just add, I think there's the simplicity of the VRF system, right? Um, those are cleanable filters, very easy to maintain, right? You pop the covers, you pull them off, you clean them. Um, we have centralized filtration on the ERVs, but again, only two units that we need to deal with. So um, in the end, I think it's an easy, pretty easy uh, preventive maintenance program with the actual equipment that's that's operating in the building. Thank you. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, so we, we do have uh, just maybe one, maybe two questions if we go quickly. 
Um, as far as the, the electric kitchen, there's there's some strong interest in, in how that all came together. Um, also, how it's working. Um, you know, was the men did the menu have to be adjusted? Or how's the kitchen staff adjusting to that? Um, do they like it? Sort of thing. You know, I think it's um, you know, our kitchen and our menu are um, focused on sustainable uh, food and and food preparation, and I think it's a draw. It, it also um, from what I've read, the indoor air quality, when you have a gas burners running all the time, um, I mean, that, uh, unless you have like extreme ventilation, it subjects the occupants of the kitchen to pollutants and health issues that, um, you know, you really do want to try to avoid. So it's a healthier environment. It really hasn't had any impact on our, our um, menu at all. Uh, we did consult with, um, I think Kate mentioned the... Um, Chris uh, Galarza, who has some real expertise in electric kitchens, and we talked to him um, before committing to this. It is a first, I think, for a, a, a big hotel, or um, there are not too many restaurants, but it, you know, it, this is the, the future. There, there's like 20 municipalities in California that won't allow a new gas hookup, and uh, uh, I haven't found any, any downside. It's, it's easier to clean your pans, and um, the, the uh, induction ranges. You know, I tried this out in my home first, I, uh, and I was hooked the, the first day. You know, it's uh, it gives you a lot more control over temperature. We even have um, chafing dishes that are induction, yeah. and um, the, the general manager was concerned when he heard we were doing electric chafing dishes instead of sterno. Uh, he said, "Oh, I've had uh, all of my circuits always blow when we use those because typically the all electric." resistance ones, you know, they might draw a thousand watts each and you put two on a circuit and, and, uh, but with these, they're the induction ones, you know, we use a maximum of 200, they adjust themselves. So, you know, I haven't found any downside to the, yeah. to the electric. Thanks. Kitchen. Thanks for that insight. Yeah. I, I was at a, a pool party with a celebrity chef over the weekend and I asked him about this, these, and he said like, he doesn't know of any, you know, high end restaurant that doesn't use, um, induction to some capacity so it's it's out there and it, we're going to see more of it um i don't know if we have 30 seconds but we did want to just ask simple roi of the energy improvements um how are they going to pay for themselves yeah well the um the neat thing is that we at we're able to access cpace financing uh where we actually use our energy model to look at um the savings that come from all of the energy efficiency initiatives. And you know, we get like a, if you sort of isolate them, they, we get the highest return from those incremental investments because a typical hotel of our size would have a utility bill that would be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and so that goes away when you generate it on site. So, and that allows us to, that savings, we can then use, we have about a $2 million CPACE loan that is, funded exclusively from those savings and, uh, you know, funds these, these additional costs, you know, the windows, uh, we could have gotten a lot less expensive windows. We paid over a thousand dollars per window. Uh, but in the scale of things, you know, maybe there was a couple hundred thousand dollars, um, extra investment there, but you recoup that very quickly from energy savings. So, uh, and then there are also the incentives, you know, for the solar and the batteries, because we have an inverter uh, and, and microcontroller that allows us to charge the batteries exclusively from solar, they qualify for the federal solar tax credit as well as the solar panels. So, um, and then we did have the benefit of the historic tax credits, which fund about a third of the cost. So, um, yeah, we were fortunate to basically have all of our energy efficiency self-funded Thanks, Bruce. Well, there it is, folks. An incredible project brought to us by Becker & Becker, LN Consulting, Stephen Winter Associates, Consigli, and many, many more. Um, thank you, Urban Green, for all uh, for this great series, and I'll pass it over. Thanks. Well, yeah, one last plug. I've got to say, come see us in person. The website is hotelmarcel.com. We have a bar and actually a, a growing happy hour scene going on. So if you're passing through New Haven, you can stop off. If you have an electric car, you can, in the, by, by August, we'll have our superchargers and overnight chargers. So come see it for yourself if you're intrigued.